and to finish us off strong. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Okay, well, let me uh, start off by thanking Brett for the note and Mark for uh, basically such a great program. It's really been a fun few days. I've really enjoyed seeing a lot of the talks, and it's a really privilege to be able to get some of the stuff uh, that we've done over the years. Brett asked me to sort of talk about some things that we've been doing and maybe blend in some stuff that we've done in the past uh, using Rydberg atoms and, and pulses that are a little bit different than the kind of pulses that uh, other people in this room have uh, in the laser community because they're not necessarily available yet. Uh, so it's somewhat a back to the future kind of talk, because perhaps it's the future, but perhaps it's also the past for us as well. I want to point out that uh, most of the work uh, that I'll be showing was either done by was done by one of two graduate students, Zha Li, uh, who's working with me now, Zheng Dong Zhang, who's a, a former student uh, who worked on the single cycle and the half cycle pulse. Uh, respectively, Francis, who worked with us uh, looking at some of Zhang Nong's data and um, in the two electron stuff that we'll be talking about. All right, so um, the, the, I'm going to try to do three things. We'll see if it works out. I mean, there's, there's no limit to how long I can talk because the meeting's <laughs> over afterwards. So I can keep talking, you can all get up and leave, and I can keep going on. But the idea is that I'd like to do three things if possible. One is to look at strong field physics at the single cycle limit. Uh, so this is looking at problems that are similar to problems that people do with, say, infrared fields or near-infrared fields, but going into the regime where it's a true single-cycle pulse, not an almost single cycle, but really single cycle. Uh, then looking at uh, also the sort of logical uh, conclusion of where you can go in, in making the shortest pulse uh, at a given frequency, and that is with a half-cycle pulse. And looking at the different things that you can do with electrons because you have this half-cycle. And lastly, I'd just like to throw some kind of a crazy little idea in there based on some work we did quite a while ago with, um, with two electrons just to see if it might be interesting sort of in the XUV or, or X-ray regime and looking at uh, core electron dynamics or using core electrons to actually probe electron dynamics. So um, Cosmin did a nice job uh, talking about a lot of the stuff with the simple man's model looking at electrons that are emitted uh, in a laser field based on the, on the simple man's model. And so the basic model is if you have an electron in the field, uh, you neglect the Coulomb field where the electron came from, you can show that the momentum that's given to the electron is proportional to the vector potential at the time when the electron is put into the continuum or put into this field. Um, if you use this simple man's model in, the, uh, in this long wavelength limit, and um, you make the assumption that you have many cycles in your field, or at least a few cycles that go adiabatically down to zero, then in fact the minimum energy that this electron will get is zero, and that's what it gets if it's ionized at the peak of the field, because that's where the vector potential is zero. And uh, the maximum energy it can get is 2QP, and that's where it will get if it's ionized at the zero in the field, because that's where the vector potential is a maximum. Um, and there are other things that can happen, like rescattering, things that people have talked a lot about in here, and one of the things, of course, is interesting to look at is sort of the direct versus rescattered electrons to see if you can distinguish them. And in fact, there's numerous uh, techniques, Cosmain talked about some, numerous techniques that rely on being able to separate energetically the recollision from the direct electrons. Right? So the, the, based on the uh, ponder motive model, uh, excuse me, based on the simple man's model, the, the uh, low energy electrons are direct electrons, and those that are above 2UP comes solely from rescattering because you, the maximum energy you can get directly is 2UP. This is a this is a picture of some sort of uh, higher frequency stuff that was done in high sapphire wavelengths long ago. Um, Cosmin showed some nice data at higher, at longer wavelengths where in fact you see a much sharper decrease in the spectrum here at the 2UP limit and then something that breaks off down here. Okay, so. What I'd like to think about is what, th what happens to this, what happens to these ideas if you move into the single cycle limit. And so again, um, I'm not aware that anyone's made a true single cycle pulse in the optical regime, but we can come pretty darn close in the terahertz regime. 
Uh, we can also make pulses that are not only sing single cycle, but they passively have a CD stability. That is, they have one particular shape. And so this is a, a terahertz field that we generated using uh, different frequency mixing or optical rectification and lithium niobate. We can make pretty uh, high amplitude, at least for terahertz radiation pulses, getting fields up to about a megavolt per centimeter in a time of one or two picoseconds. So what would we like to do? We'd like to look at ionization in these pulses. And one way to look at these the fields, okay, a megavolt per centimeter, you're actually not going to ionize the ground state of an atom. Right? But we can sort of uh, look at ionization anyway, even if something like a ground state, if we just say photoionize the electron and put it in the continuum, it's a lot like one of these strong field experiments. We'll just put the electron in the continuum at specific times during the pulse and see what that pulse does to it. This is just a streaking measurement. It's been done in a lot of different ways. It's been done for, for attosecond measurements. It's done in the terahertz regime as well. Um, and, but the basic idea is, of course, if you put the electron in this field at different times, you gain different energies just based on the simple man's model. Okay? So the momentum transfer from which you get the energy is just given by the vector potential, or scaled vector potential. Okay, so what do we see? Well, this is what we see for the momentum transfer in our single cycle field. And if we take the derivative of that, we get basically the field shape. So this is the field shape in our vacuum chamber. This is actually what we're looking at. The high frequency stuff is noise. We actually don't have any frequencies there. So it's sort of like the envelope going through this high frequency stuff. It, this comes because it's taking the derivative of this, numeric, of this uh, experimental data. So you're going to get some noise from taking the derivative. So what are some notable features? Well, one, it is a single cycle. You don't see any other cycles out here, and even, even small ones. Um, it's chirped. That is, you have high frequencies here and lower frequencies there. And there's a field asymmetry. Uh, it needs, there is a field asymmetry because the interval of this pulse is zero, at least the interval of the field is zero, so that this one has a, is broader in time, but shorter in amplitude, and this one's narrower in time and uh, taller. Right? So we can define, if you will, if you give me a little bit of latitude, a ponder motive energy associated with this pulse. Now, a ponder motive energy can be defined for a single cycle, that's the way it's typically done, it's the average energy over a cycle, but because of this chirp, it's sort of a weird thing because this frequency appears in there. So what is the frequency? But if you'll let me to use basically the width of this part, and the width of this part is the frequency of these two lobes, and then multiple, basically the field amplitude is inversely proportional to this width, then I have a well-defined ponder motive energy for that pulse. And it's about 15 eV. Okay, keep in mind this is a terahertz pulse, so the average photon energy is a few wave numbers, and it's 15 eV ponder motive energy, so it's big. And if you look over here, okay, we're getting momentum transfer. This is atomic units, so we're getting two and a half units two and a half un uh, atomic units of energy or momentum from that. We get a lot of energy out of these pulses because, of course, the frequency is really, really small, even though the field is, is also really, really small. Okay, so what does this tell us? Well, one, if we look right here at the maximum of the field, what, what, is the, what did the simple man's model say about what's the, what's the energy you get at the peak of the field? Zero. Zero. No. Two and a half UP. What's the, field, what's the maximum energy you can get at the center, at, at, at the zero? It's supposed to be the maximum field, 2 UP. We see 6.4. And if, yeah, this question? This is because the, the half cycles are a different shape. No, no. It's because it's a single cycle. It's because it is uh, the slowly varying envelope approximation breaks down. And what you get is, this is what you get if you actually compute. If you use a perfect sine wave, you get 2 UP for these peaks and you get 8 UP for the center here, okay? And it has to do with the fact that in the, in the simple man's model, the standard one you hear about, you adiabatically wind down the energy down to zero. But if you keep the full energy that you have in that half cycle, it's that big, okay? So um, this is kind of interesting, kind of bothersome in some cases too, because if your experiments are helped by making the pulses shorter and shorter, but yet they rely on being able to distinguish direct from indirect electrons, you've got a real problem if you've got eight UP electrons coming out from direct energy. So that, that's the main point of this. We can also use these pulses to ionize atoms, just not ground states of atoms. So this is um, some data. This is looking at basically the terahertz field to ionize the atom threshold as a function of N. It's a log log plot. The black circles here are data. And there are some open circles on top of it. A lot of time you can't see them because they're right on top of the data that came out of a classical trajectory Monte Carlo simulation with a soft Coulomb potential. Tom Gallier talked a lot about this process and how when you have a non-hydrogenic system, you expect this ionization to be uh, line to be 
scale of 1 over 16 into the fourth. If you have a hydrogenic system, you expect it to be like 1 over 9 into the fourth due to the polarizability of the molecule and the star uh, polarizability of the atom and the star shift that occurs. Okay. Just basically, if you're in this lower lying state, you get a star shift which takes you down to a, to a higher binding energy, so it's a little bit harder to pull the electron off. But in both cases, it scales like n to the minus 4. What we measure, this dotted line is actually n to the minus 3, which goes right through this data. And what it turns out to be, there's a couple of time scales here beyond, we're in, I should say, we're in the, in the long wavelength limit, or the low frequency limit, because the frequency here of our radiation is not only much less than the binding energy of the electron, but it's also less than the separation between adjacent states. Okay, so it really is in the long wavelength or the, or the low frequency limit. However, the Kepler period is not necessarily the right time scale here. There's actually two additional time scales that turn out to be important. One of those time scales is basically the time for the electron to realize that it's not in hydrogen. And so that it shouldn't ionize along this line, it should ionize along this one. And that's basically the time scale it takes for the electron as it's moving around in its classical orbit from scattering off of the non-hydrogenic potential and going out in a different direction. And that takes something that's several Kepler periods long in order for that to happen. And our pulses are kind of short. So after we get to a point where um, the N is getting bigger and bigger and the Kepler period is getting longer and longer, we actually don't have enough time in that pulse for the electron to realize it's not in hydrogen. So then we would expect to move from this 1 over 16 into the fourth line to this 1 over 9 into the fourth line. But we don't just stop there, we keep going and we end up on the other side here. Why are we over here? We're over here because even if this barrier dips down and the electron is trying to scoot over this barrier, either at 1 over 16 into the fourth or 1 over 9 into the fourth, there's a problem. And that is, it starts off right here on this dashed blue line, and it has to move all the way from here to here, even to reach the saddle point to get over. And it takes a time, which is actually considerably longer than the Kepler period, to get from here to here. So there's an additional time scale, which isn't just finding the saddle point angularly to get over it, but it's actually going out radially to get over it. So if you have a short pulse like this, you might find that you actually don't have enough time to ionize. And that's where this, this extra scaling law uh, comes from. So it looks like 1 over n cubed for this particular pulse shape and pulse duration. But it's not any of the standard forms people have seen before. This is probably not something that would be important for, say, a small molecule in its ground state, because the, the dynamics are very different in terms of getting to the satellite or tunneling through. However, if you had a really big molecule where you have electrons that are delocalized over space, you actually might find a suppression that's similar to this in that field that's very different than what you would see for, say, the ground state of a small molecule or, or an atom. So we can also look at energies. Um, this is a really big energy scale here. It goes up to 60 eV. This is what happens if we put uh, electrons in bound states, say n equals 6, n equals 7, all the way up to about n equals 15. You put an electron in n equals 6 state and turn up this terahertz field as high as we can turn it up in our lab, you can see 60 eV electrons coming out. That's 70,000 times the photon energy. Right? Not a particularly convenient way of thinking about this problem, but people like to talk about how nonlinear their processes are. This is a very nonlinear process. <laughs> okay. The one thing that I think is, this, these are all taken with the same maximum terahertz energy. So this is just the electron distribution with the same terahertz, peak terahertz field. What you see is that n equal 15, which is bound the least, gains the least energy. And n equal 6, which is bound the most, gains the most energy by a lot. And so, what's going on here? It's sort of opposite to what you would expect from a perturbative model, where you would expect that, okay, everything absorbs a certain number of photons, a certain uh, degree of nonlinearity, and certainly you would end up higher up if you started higher up in the energy. That's not the case. Also, in the multi-cycle regime, multi-cycle over the barrier, you would expect that if you are bound more tightly, you're ionizing closer to the peak of the pulse, peak of the field, where you get more energy, and therefore, excuse me, where you get less energy from the field, and therefore you have less energy out here. So we don't see either one. And it has to do with the same thing we learned from the streaking, which is that in the single cycle, the simple man's model looks different. It's still the simple man's model, it's still the same physics, but the result in terms of how much energy you can get out are completely different. So if you ionize the lower end state near the peak of the field, it still gets about 2 UP of energy coming out. So it can get a substantial amount of energy when UP is 15 EV. Um, if, in fact, though, we are ionizing a lower state, still at the same field, the same peak field, it ionizes and it can, in fact, saturate the ionization on the leading edge of this pulse, so you end up with a lot less momentum and a lot less energy transfer. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. The same process, 
as just seeing that the energy transfer is different. Okay, so if in fact this idea is correct, then we would expect that if we looked at the energy distribution of the electrons coming out as a function of the peak terahertz field, that the maximum energy the electrons would achieve would actually decrease over time. Maybe not quite true because the field is going up. So relative to the ponder motive energy, we would expect that if we got 2 UP here and 0 UP here, as we increase the peak field and we ionize further and further away from this peak, our energy would drop relative to UP. So if we scale our energy transfer with UP and look at threshold, we might be able to see that, in fact, the energy of the electron drops off as, as we increase the field over thresholds. So that's what I want to plot here. So if we have a tightly bound state like n equals 7, we actually can't apply very much field to get very far above threshold, but we see pretty much 2 UP all the time. But if we look at n equal 11, we actually start off at about 2 UP, and then we can gain a little bit of energy, and that's probably because we can ionize some on this side, but some on this side of this pulse, uh, this peak. And when we're over here ionizing, we're actually going to gain a little bit more energy than what we had here. So we actually get an increase, and then a decrease. By the way, the, the error bars on these, number, on these points are smaller than the points, so that you don't show up see them. So there's space uh, that looks kind of a jagged line. We just don't have enough density of dots in here. Uh, there's another point here. Then you see this thing just start to decrease. So as we start getting higher and higher field, we start saturating the ionization more and more down on this curve and getting less and less electrons. The one thing that's interesting that we don't fully understand, we have some ideas about what would be going on, is for the very high end states, like n equal 15, it starts way up here, even at threshold. So it's not ionizing just right here. It's ionizing somewhere else in the pulse, like inside here. or it's gaining energy over a significant fraction of the pulse. So part of the idea might be, well, if, this, if the peak field is right at threshold, maybe it's ionizing from this lobe here. But in fact, the electron starts to gain energy here. And as it's moving to its turning point, it actually doesn't have to turn around as it usually would in this field. It can keep moving towards the turning point, the saddle point, and not ionize until the field is over here. But it started gaining energy right here. And so it's a non-adiabatic effect that it's gaining energy as it's moving out. Okay, the rest of this process has all been purely adiabatic. This only occurs for the higher end states because for the low end states, the Kepler period is so short compared to the pulse time, the, the, the electron is going in and out, in and out many times as the pulse, as the field is rising and going back down again. But at the very highest end, it's maybe not coming in and out too many times. So maybe it's using that last pass out to, to gain a lot of energy. So we're not sure about that yet. But that's it's something interesting. Okay. So I guess I'm doing okay with time. So, um, oh, I went back. Let's talk about our next topic. Let's go on to half cycle pulses. Again, something that probably isn't available, at least uh, as far as I'm aware of, in the optical frequency or in the UV or VUV or anything. Uh, it has been available for a long time in another context, which is, elect which is collisions, right? These pulses are made all the time in collisions. They're not well controllable in collisions, but are not necessarily, but my laser pointer's dead. I can use the red one. Mine's back on. <laughs> See, it felt, it felt nervous. It was using jo his job, so it decided to work a little bit again. I'll keep trying. Anyway, um, it, this pulse is generated uh, using by, by uh, shining uh, laser light, a short laser pulse on a photoconductive switch, and it generates a pulse shape like this. It's got a very large uh, positive lobe and a long negative tail. So if you want to be particular about it and you want to say, well, it can't be a half cycle because uh, the integrated field has to be zero. Well, we can make this part of the pulse infinitely long and have zero amplitude, and I think we're good. Right? So let's just assume that's the way they are. Also, we actually don't have to propagate this pulse into the far field. We can generate it in the near field, in which in case it's perfectly fine for it to have a DC component. So there's lots of ways we can do this and have it be OK. So don't worry about the fact that it seems to violate all kinds of uh, basic principles to you. Okay. Uh, so what can we do with these pulses? Well, these pulses can, if, if in fact we're working in a different regime than we were working in uh, with most strong field laser experiments, now we're going to actually work on the impulsive regime, where the duration of the pulse is much, much shorter than, say, the Kepler period of the electron. So the electron is essentially frozen during the time of this pulse. In that case, we can just using the basic idea again that the momentum transfer is just related to the vector potential, but in this case, for a half cycle pulse, the vector potential change looks like this. So we can import momentum to an electron, and basically we just take any wave function we want, and we can translate the wave function in momentum space. 
So if you imagine you have some bound state and you just translate the momentum and momentum translate the wave function in momentum space, we've created a non-stationary state which will then shake or jiggle around in some particular way. You can think about this really as sort of uh, since it's, it's sort of like a delta function pulse, this is sort of like sort of the, the Green's function approach to, to coherent control. We can push and pull electrons around in, in, in different directions based on basically just these delta function kicks that we can give it. So we can build up any transfer we want simply by kicking it in the right direction at the right time. So that, that actually works. We did some experiments a long time ago on this. This is one where I just took uh, an eigenstate, a uh, Rydberg eigenstate, and kicked it. So if we just have a stationary wave function, this is big Rydberg electron, and you just say kick it from underneath, what happens to it? And the charge just starts oscillating. And so you can actually see this oscillation of charge back and forth here. These are just multiple traces of the momentum distribution uh, as a function of time. And I'll get back to how we actually measure this momentum distribution later. But this is what you would see if you could look at the momentum distribution. Again, not so surprising that if you translate it one way and it moves off the center in the, in the potential, then it just wants to bounce back and forth in that potential after you do that translation. Here's another cool one that he did. This is actually a calculation, not data, but we do have data. It's just a little bit uglier. Um, of actually recombining electrons with, with, uh, into an atom. So we actually take continuum electrons we put them back on. We actually have a structured continuum, so this is not sort of a quantum control problem with a true open uh, continuum, but we actually structure the continuum so we know, actually know where the electrons are. We know their momentum and we know their position as a function of time by ionizing the atom with a laser first. And so then as the, the, the wave packet's expanding, we kick it and we can actually put the electron back on and make some interesting patterns. In fact, we can localize the electron in certain regions of space and you can think of all kinds of fun things you might want to do with that electron after you've localized it in space at far away from the nucleus. Okay, so we get three-dimensional localization this way. All right, so how would I measure, say, this distribution? Well, let's think about that. Well, in order to get there, we need to think about ionization. This is a very different type of strong field ionization than anybody's talked about here. It's impulsive. So the idea is if you have an electron anywhere or a wave packet anywhere inside this potential, if we give it a momentum kick, we can transfer energy to it and therefore move its energy up. It's essentially, its position doesn't change at all. We just change its energy and it can leave the atom this way. It's a completely opposite limit to the over the barrier tunneling limit where you actually take the potential and you tip it over and you wait for stuff to leak out adiabatically where there's absolutely zero energy exchange between the electron and the field, here it's all energy exchange. And of course you think, well, why doesn't it potentially tip over? Of course it tips over, but it happens very, very fast. The electron doesn't move <coughs> during the time that it tips over. So you can only gain energy this way. So we're going to use that ionization as a probe of momentum. And so this is the simple classical picture. Imagine that we have an electron in, a, in an orbit that's going around. It's got some momentum. We give it a little bit of kick. Well, if we give it, if this kick is big enough, the momentum it gets afterwards can be big enough so that it can ionize. And we can figure out how much kick we have to give it for a given momentum because we know that the energy transfer is just given by this equation here. And if this energy transfer is equal to or greater than the binding energy of the electron, it ionizes. If we have a different momentum, maybe even an electron moving in the other direction or with less momentum, we might have to give it a bigger kick for it to ionize. So if we look at how hard it is to ionize this electron with different size kicks, it can tell us something about the momentum distribution. It can do more than just tell us a little bit about it, it can give it to us very precisely. This is sort of a quantum mechanical way of viewing it. If we know that the energy transfer looks like this, and we have to give the electron an energy transfer at least as big as, uh, the ioniz as its ionization potential, then for a given impulse A, for a given kick strength A, there's a certain critical momentum above which the electron will ionize. So if we just look at the momentum distribution, it looks like this. We can draw a line and say, critical momentum here, everything above that ionizes. We put a different distribution here, everything above it ionizes. So the ionization probability we get just depends on what's the probability that the momentum is greater than some value. So you can imagine that if we then scan this A, this which is basically just proportional to the peak field, if we just scan A from zero to some maximum value, we just move this critical line across this, and we're just getting the integral of the momentum distribution. So if we get the integral of the momentum distribution, it looks something like this. So this is just the ionization probability as a function of field. And if we take its derivative, basically we just get the momentum distribution back. Right. So that's effectively what we can do. This is for a stationary state. We can also do it for time-dependent states. 
So this is a rather complicated wave packet. It was a radial and angular motion of a stark wave packet in an electric field. And this is looking at the momentum distribution on two different axes, one along the field and one perpendicular. We just ran this experiment twice, once kicking in this direction, once kicking in this direction, after we had launched a particular wave packet and we watch it evolve. So you get really detailed information about the dynamics here, just by looking at the time-dependent momentum distribution of these different coordinates. OK, so this is all fun. We can take these one electron atoms, we can look at momentum distribution, we can kick them around, but how about some physics that's a little bit more complicated than this? Right, so let's think about the two electron problem. So we heard some about uh, this yesterday from, from David's talk and, and the sort of the classical picture, and wouldn't it be interesting if you could sort of go in and think about these sort of uh, planetary orbits and these classical trajectories and watch electrons move around in time and exchange energy and angular momentum as they moved around. So this is sort of the classical view of two electrons on an atom moving about, exchanging energy and angular momentum and going from one configuration to another. Right, so this is a wonderful thing you could do on a computer to watch classically, but couldn't, could we do it in the lab? Of course, you have this quantum mechanical view where what you really have at any particular energy is a linear superposition of all possible configurations of the electron at that state. So this is an entangled superposition. And so really what we need to do in order to see this in the laboratory is build wave packets that are superpositions of these eigenstates at different energies and see if we can watch this evolution. They have to do this in a careful way so it's not just a complete mess all the time. You want to have a finite number of of, um, of uh, these types of orbits that you might go between, or you have to start off at least in one that you know very well and watch, and watch how it behaves. So this particular case that I've shown here maybe isn't too interesting. It, it, this problem, I should say, the two electron problem is pretty well understood in a couple of cases. One of the cases is where both the electrons are, are very tightly bound, like in the ground state of helium. So people know how to solve that problem. And, and the reason is because, of course, there are very few configurations that are contributing with very, large, very much amplitude to this problem. The other case, which is very easy to handle, is when one electron is nearly, uh, is barely excited and the other one's highly excited. Because in that case, you restrict the interaction between these two electrons to a very small volume. And when you do that, you can also just then treat the problem using quantum defect theory, and it's relatively straightforward to solve. But in the regime where these two electrons are both highly excited, and they both have comparable energies, so they both span a very large volume, then there are many, many, many different configurations this thing might take over, and it gets to be a very, very complicated problem, not only to think about in the laboratory, but also to think about how do you calculate the dynamics in that case. So the particular case I'm interested in is one where we're going to put both electrons in Rydberg states within a few hundred wave numbers of the double ionization limit of the atom. So what I show here is an energy level diagram, sort of an independent particle picture. So I have different energy levels of the ion, and for each energy level of the ion, I have sets of Rydberg series converging to those limits of the ion. And so if I get within this range, there are about 10 to the fifth states per wave number. So I've got a huge number of states up here, a huge number of configurations that I could be in. The interesting dynamics, of course, are not this term and not this term. This term describes, say, the motion of one electron, uh, bound to a, an ion in a particular state. This is the motion of the ionic electron in these independent particle pictures. It's this stuff, which is the electron-electron correlation beyond zero's order, which is, is interesting and what we'd like to study. Just keep in mind, there's actually one term of electron-electron correlation in here already, and that's the screening of uh, one of, the, one of the, uh, the nuclear charges by, the, by one of the electrons. So there is some, some amount of screening, some amount of electron-electron interaction already built into this simple picture, but it's this stuff that's more interesting. We dial in the complexity, the closer we get to the ionization limit, the more complex the problem gets. So here's the problem that we'd like to do in the laboratory. So we start off, we can make these radial wave packets pretty easily in the lab. One where the electron starts off at the nucleus and you photoionize it almost. So the electron is here, it gets energy, it starts leaving, it runs out, but then it runs out of kinetic energy and gets sucked back in, and it will do this several times. There's dispersion, so that motion eventually damps out, but you get some breathing for some time. So suppose we did that with both electrons. We launch one electron out in this radially breathing state, and then we take, while it's away from the nucleus, we launch the other one. And we can launch the second one at different times relative to when we launch this one, which controls when these two electrons are in close proximity to each other uh, at later times. 
And the nice thing about it is we know very precisely what the configuration of this wave packet is at the initial time. We know the energy and we know the angular momentum as well as allowed by the, uh, what is that principle called? Uncertainty principle? As well as the uncertainty principle will allow. So, uh, we do this in a two-step process. So we excite one electron, we excite another electron. The first electron is in a state of about n equal 23 of a z equal 1 ion. It goes out to an outer turning point of about 1100 atomic units and has a period of about 1.8 picoseconds. We have our other electron, which we will call the inner electron, because it sees a charge z equal 2, but it's got a higher principal quantum number, goes out actually further out than this wave packet would, and takes a longer time. So, of course, this idea that one of them is moving through the other one means that this sort of description is one of them being inside and one of them being outside is completely violated after a while. This thing's going to get messed up. But what we'd like to probe, at least, is when does it get mixed, messed up? When is there going to be a lot of energy exchange between these two particles so that it doesn't look have this simple beating motion anymore? How long does that take? So, well, maybe we can use this, um, these impulsive kicks to help us figure this out. Well, if I look at my same little classical model and I have two electrons moving with some momentum, each, P1 and P2, then if I give it a kick, it's possible I might not go both of them off, okay, or at least give them some energy. And if they're moving in different directions or with different momentum, I'll get a different final result. So in principle, if I measure how much energy that I transfer, and the energy that I transfer just looks like this, if I measure how much energy I transfer to the two electrons, I could measure this correlation function. I wouldn't measure anything about the electrons individually, but I'd measure the correlation function. The hard thing is measuring this change in energy, because it means I have to be able to span the whole space of the two electrons. One might be in a continuum, one might be in a bound state, and it's very difficult to do that experimentally. So I'm not prepared to do it yet, but I think it would be a great thing to do. If you kick it hard enough, this A squared term would guarantee that both of them are in the continuum, and you could make this measurement. But we weren't able to do that in our regime yet. Okay, so we did something a little bit simpler. What we did was say, okay, let's start off exciting our two electrons to these states, and then we're going to apply a long pulsed field, a long time later, that is big enough in amplitude to field ionize in the way that Tom Gallagher was talking about field ionization, both these electrons. So if they're just sitting here, we do nothing to the system, we, see, we can doubly ionize the atom. Okay? So if we come in and we kick both that our system before anything happens, and then we'll see 100% uh, barium double plus. Okay, because the, the kick doesn't do anything to our system, and both of the electrons get ionized. Now, if we in fact come in with a with our kick before these two electrons have exchanged a lot of energy, but after we've actually put the second electron up here, then what we'll see is well, we don't know. Okay, it's something in between. We might get some barium double plus, we might not. It depends on what happens to the energies of these two electrons. But if we wait and kick this system after these two electrons have communicated so that one of them has a lot more energy than the other one, one of them may have ionized, the other one may have dropped back down to a much more tightly bound state, then when we kick it, it actually doesn't have enough energy to get above this field ionization limit, so we can't make barium double plus anymore. So the idea is, is, as we move the kick delay from before we excite one of the electrons to they're both excited to one of them has left, we should see the amount of barium double plus that we see go from some maximum value down to zero. So that's what we want to see. And so here actually is, what am I getting about about two or three minutes left? Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll go a little bit faster than this, but not so much hopefully that it becomes an unintelligible. Maybe it is already, all right. Um, so the idea here is what we're looking at is a function of time. This delay here is the delay of the half cycle pulse coming after I have launched my first wave packet. And this green line is where I come in and launch the second electron. So if we look here, this line tells me, well, for one, it says I should, if I haven't launched the second electron yet, why is this probability changing? This is the probability of seeing barium double plus before the other electron. It turns out that this wave packet is a little more complicated than the one I described to you. It's got an excited core, so this thing actually auto-ionizes on its own over time. So its amplitude decreases by itself, and so that's a complication that we'll have to get around. But what we see is that if we don't excite that second electron very fast, we get a lot of barium double plus signal over a long time. If we come in and we excite that second electron, we see that basically as soon as we excite it, the signal just drops almost to zero. Nothing else happens. This is 
instantly. These two electrons are large orbitals. It says it doesn't matter, basically, where I put this one in space, necessarily. If I launch that second electron, where this first electron is in space is unimportant. When I put the second one in, it makes the probability of seeing variable plus drop to zero, which means that energy is exchanged almost instantly upon the excitation, even if those two electrons aren't very, very close to each other. Okay, and this is a, a lot of different data looking at different positions of this Rydberg electron when I launch the second one. And this red line is basically showing this is where I'm coming in with the second electron regardless of where this one's position is. So different positions are different places along here. See, the pattern looks about the same all the time. Right when I bring in that second electron, the signal just drops off to zero. So we have a really strong interaction that seems to be independent of where this first electron is when I launch the second one. I get a little bit of a difference in the rate of decay here, and I get a little difference in the background here, which might have something to do with some physics, but it's hard to sort that out. So one of the things Francis was, was helping us look at, one thing that we got out of this uh, was that the decay happens very, very fast. Okay, so this is a, some calculations that Francis did. They're actually both quantum and cl classical calculations here. It's hard to tell the difference between the two. Um, so he basically sort of gave us evidence that this drop-off happens essentially instantaneously regardless of where the first electron is. These different curves are where the first electron is when the second one is launched. You may look at that and say, well, gee, it doesn't look the same. This seems to be showing a difference. The way the calculations are done, there's a mask, there's an absorbing mask or boundary, and so at different locations of that outer, uh, that other electron, it takes longer time to get to the mask. But basically, it's ionized at about the same time regardless. Okay, so this is just propagation time. So the other interesting thing that he was able to pull out was L mixing. It shows that the, the states basically, the angular momentum is completely mixed too, and all possible values of angular momentum in that short amount of time as well. And also that. Um, an interesting thing is that you could get significantly longer times for this thing to live. It wouldn't decay nearly as fast if you just decrease the energy of that second electron by a little bit. So these two wave packets didn't cross through each other. So there's a lot in there that I'll go through quickly. Maybe people can ask questions about it. This is an idea of exploiting electron correlation to probe electron distributions, time-dependent electron distributions. So imagine I have this two-electron system where one electron is a core electron and the other one uh, can be near or far away. It could be a valence electron. And I want to think about a transition, a resonant transition of this core electron from some bound state to some other bound state. Well, my ability to do that and where that resonance occurs, and basically whether it turns out to be a broad looking line or a narrow line, depends on where this electron is when I try to do that excitation. If this electron is very far away, this thing thinks it's an ion, and nothing happens. Basically, it just looks like an ionic transition. If, however, this other electron is nearby, it can polarize that core and also change the lifetime of the state and broaden it significantly. So where the resonance occurs and the width of the resonance change depending on where this electron is. We actually were able to measure this uh, in tightly bound state in, in a, in a two-electron problem in calcium uh, many years ago. The idea was we put one electron in a wave packet where it actually moved in and out and we actually measured the line shape for doing an isolated core excitation from the core electron from an S state to a P state. And so what we found was, depending on where the electron was in, in its orbit, we got a different line shape. Okay, this is a calculation. This is the measurement. These are the line shapes up here. You can see this sort of symmetric, narrow line shape and this broader, asymmetric line shape that you see here for these two cases, depending on where the electron is in space. So what it tells you is, this electron is a marker for where this other electron is if you're trying to drive a resonant transition. And so this stupid idea that I had while I was just sitting in my room making this talk the other night was, suppose that we actually have, say, a, a resonant core transition. And we have a laser, maybe it's an X-ray laser, an XUV, that we detune a little bit from that resonance. Well, nothing will happen unless there happens to be an electron nearby, which will then broaden that resonance and make it possible to do this excitation and then get an autoionization or an OJ out of here. And so you only get a signal if an electron comes by. So if you have this process going time resolved, you have a time resolved <coughs> measure of the electron density around this particular site. So if you have a resonant transition in a particular atom, maybe you have this time resolved and site resolved uh, measure of the electron density. So I'll just leave up the conclusions there, um, and that'll be it.